Hi guys, in one of our recent videos we showed a Napoleonic battle report played on a modular terrain table. In this video I thought I'd show you how we made the modular tiles. The tiles are approximately 60 by 60 centimeters or 2 foot by 2 foot and about 5 centimeters thick. The thickness of the tile allows us to cut down into the tile to add negative terrain features like rivers, streams, ditches, gullies and the like. Positive features like hills can easily be modelled upwards from the base tile. Here's a few tile examples. This rather extreme example shows a rocky outcrop which is surrounded by a marsh on one side and a river on the other. The inspiration for this tile came from the description of a Viking camp in Anglo-Saxon Britain where the Vikings had camped upon the hill for defensive purposes. A more permanent defensive structure is the Mott, as depicted here. The Mott is the hill with the surrounding fence and tower upon it. This often was accompanied by a bailey, which is the outer area which the tower looks down upon where the people would live and would retreat to the Mott and the tower for defense with the bailey is attacked. Here you can see the large swamp or marsh that featured in some of my earlier videos where I showed you how to make grasses and reeds and tufts and such like. Here you can see it completed with the resin water effects poured in to complete the terrain feature. Here we have a classic river and road network with a bridge crossing the river. To make sure I got the modularity right in the tiles, I asked the guys at Perry Miniatures how they laid out their own terrain table and they were kind enough to tell me that they always made sure that the rivers would flow in and out from the center of a tile edge and the roads measured six inches from a corner. That way, no matter which way round your tiles go, they should all line up. Here we've got a river corner. Um, one of the ways to sell the terrain piece is to make sure it's believable. In this case, I wanted to show that the river had changed course because it had met the cliff face couldn't go over the cliff, so turned round. Fairly simple to do, but it's a nice effect on the board. Here we have an underhive tile for the Necromunda game. It's comprised from a combination of 3D printed tile pieces and also purchased tiles from the Games Workshop range. The canal was added to add a bit of interest to the tile and an obstacle for players to deal with and water effect resin was poured in to complete the effect. Again to add a bit of interest to that submerged area lots of bits and pieces of things were stuck to the bottom of the canal first to make it interesting to look at including a um, rather ferocious looking sump crocodile which is a feature of the Goliath gang. One feature of the underhive setting is its decrepitude and here we have some tiles which have broken and fallen away to leave huge holes in the surface where models if they're not careful can fall through or they can try and jump at their peril. Again these are a mix of 3D printed and purchased tiles. Keeping the sci-fi vibe going, this is an ash waste tile I've built featuring a dried out riverbed. This will give models somewhere to hide and take cover in a relatively barren landscape. And here's a second ash waste tile featuring a hillock instead. A simple cliff face with blown ash and dust over it will give a linear line of sight blocking terrain feature or would even give models a height advantage if standing on top, being able to then look down upon their lower adversaries. So this is our base tile. It's basically a timber frame with a plywood base screwed onto the bottom and then into the void within the timber frame. The polystyrene sheet is glued in place. Here I've made a smaller one foot by one foot tile for a Zone Mortalis tile piece 
with 3D printed tile pieces glued on top. Again, same construction, but that depth will allow us it to go alongside those other tiles which feature the canal. To store all the tiles I've made and keep them safe, I've made a simple racking system I've erected in my garage. The timber framing I use is made from cavity batten which I can get from my local DIY store. Once the timber is cut I use a simple corner clamp to hold the pieces at a 90 degree angle to butt join them together. I roughly cut the timber to length to start with and then accurately measure it and cut these pieces at a perfect 90 degree using the Micromark table saw. This is a great hobby addition to your toolkit and will cut a range of materials at a range of angles depending on the tools you use with the table saw. But here I'm just doing a straightforward 90 degree cut which is assisted by the little sledge and the safety gauge obviously keeps your fingers from getting chopped off in the process. And there's your perfect 90 degree cut. With the timber cut, it's then a simple job of just using the 90 degree corner clamp to hold the two pieces accurately in place, ready for drilling. Line it up, give it a squeeze and it locks into place. Then you can drill your hold in without the wood moving. And then just chamf the top so the screw head will fit. I'm going to use some chipboards countersunk head screws. These have got a little square end on them which I quite like with the driver. And we can zap that straight in and try not to leave your tool in the job. Once the timber frame is made we then need to cut some plywood to go on the base of it. Here I'm using a 7mm thick piece of plywood that is 1200 by 600 mil and I'm going to cut it in half to give me two pieces for two tiles. Once measured and marked out, clamp it in place and use your jigsaw or other saw that you have on hand to cut it in half. Sand the cut edges and then it's just a matter of screwing down the plywood panel onto our timber frame. Line it up and away you go with your drill and screws. Countersunk head chipboard screws again but a bit shorter this time. Drill the hole widen the hole for the screw head it's handy to have two drills or three and screw your screw in. Having a couple of drills or power drivers will save you a lot of time and having to keep on changing the bits, the drill, the widener or the screw head. I usually put one screw in each corner and also one in the middle of each long edge. So that's our timber frame and base complete. All we have to do now is fill it with some poly. The polystyrene sheet I use is an insulation material that comes in 50mm thick sheets that are 1200 by 600mm from my DIY store. 
Measure and cut the polystyrene sheet into squares that will fit inside the frame. I used a jigsaw to do this. To glue the polystyrene sheet into place, I use a water-activated Gorilla Glue product, which is a foaming glue and will cure in about an hour's time. It does expand on drying, so you need to weight the polystyrene sheet down while it dries. After an hour, the glue will have dried sufficient for us to continue with the project. The problem that I have at this point is that the polystyrene is 50mm thick and it's up against a 45mm batten, which means there's a 5mm overlap, which we need to get rid of. To solve this problem, I DIY built a hot wire cutter, a big one. To make the hot wire cutter, I found a YouTube video of from a guy who was making a wire cutter to make surfboards. Um, I followed his instructions, came up with this, and it works reasonably well. I'm not an electrician by any means, and oddly enough, this will only work on the 9 volt setting. I thought if I turned it up to 12 volts, the wire would get hotter and it would cut faster, but it just stops working, so I don't know why that is. Anyway, it works well enough, it takes a while. You can get a um, proper bow cutter uh, from the hot wire foam factory tool people in America but it's about $400 so I haven't stretched myself that far yet. This does the job for the time being. The cutaway layer of foam can be kept for future use. So that's our tile cut smooth, we just need to fill those gaps between the polystyrene and the timber frame. For that we're going to use some ready mix villa. Use a small trowel or putty knife and get that gap filled in with the filler. Just steadily work your way around, it's quite easy to do. And once that's applied and dried, the tile is done and ready for use. We can now start making terrain on this tile or into this tile as we want to. So we'll cover that in a next video. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it. See ya.